Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 111 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltaka. Thanks for joining me again today on the podcast. I've got uh, I got a few things to cover, and then I have kind of an extended, I think it's like 23 minutes, 24 minutes uh, conversation with Tracy Wilson because we got a lot of stuff actually to cover. There's a lot of stuff going on at the CCFR as, as usual. Um, I can't wait to the day when it's like, man, we got just got nothing to nothing to say. Just want to say hi, and then <laughs> and then that's it. And the podcast over like a minute. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be at that point anytime soon. But uh, anyway, um, I've got some things I want to talk about in the opener, but. Before we do that, I want to thank our sponsors, Vortex, the force of optics. Thanks to our friends over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support the podcast. We really appreciate it. You can check out their fantastic products over at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. And of course, our excellent friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers Chapter of Safari Club International. They do a lot of great work, including supporting the CCFR. So you can check out all the fantastic that all the fantastic work <laughs> that they do over at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com. Make sure you check that out. Okay, now um, a couple of things I want to cover really quick. So the Mass Casualty Commission, which is the commission looking into the events um, in in Nova Scotia, right, the mass shooting, and it's looking like it was a mass shooting uh, in particular, but. Um, Anyway, the commission is uh, has been doing public hearings. You can see those on the commission website. You can stream them and, and be along with that. You can also download a lot of documents from that website. I would encourage you to hold on to a lot of those documents, stick them on your computer somewhere. That's a good thing to do. Preserve them for posterity. And, um, and our role at the CCFR is actually starting now. So you'll see a report from us um, pop up on the commission website probably in a month or two. I'm not sure what their timetable is, but we're having to leaf our way through all the evidence and, uh, and, and, you know, provide our contribution, which is an analysis of gun laws that, you know, might've stopped it, gun laws that, you know, didn't stop it, that, you know, are on the books that are, are worthless, maybe, uh, most certainly probably. Um, but, <laughs> um, and just, yeah, how can we stop this from happening again? And did, you know, do regulations and whatnot have a role in, to, to play in those things? So that part is coming up soon. So just want to let you know. Also, when it comes to the um, the uh, the webcasts, the the hearings and whatnot, uh, Tracy Wilson has been watching those and live tweeting through them. So here's a little takeaway. You know, so every couple of minutes she throws a takeaway up there. If you want to follow her on Twitter, you can find her at T Wilson Ottawa. So at T Wilson Ottawa on Twitter. So check that out. Next thing I want to talk about is CCFR Radio on the Air, which is our new TV show with Wild TV it premieres tonight. So uh, it's been a little while in the making. It's it's a tremendous amount of work for for one person to do. Uh, but uh, anyway, it premieres tonight. And my special guest tonight is Nicole Franks. She is a world champion fast draw competitor, and uh, she holds some world records. And she's uh yeah she's awesome. So I really enjoyed our talk. So check that out. And if you do have Wild TV and you're able to check out the episode, leave me some comments and let me know what you think. It's going to be very similar to this, except shorter, more to the point, with some with some guests to break it up a little bit more. So it should be more entertaining to watch some B-roll as well. You know, we stick clip, we, you know, show clips and stuff like that. Right. Um, but let me know what you think, because as you know, the reason why we're doing it is we're trying to bring the community together. We're trying to get more people interested in getting involved and, and having some influence on whether or not they can own guns in the future and, and whether or not their children can own guns. Right. That's what's at stake. And, and if we're going to do that, we need everybody. And there's only a very small group of people within the firearm community that actively do things to help. And that's, we got to change that if we're going to, if we're going to hang on to guns and because right now we're losing, right? We got a government that wants them and they have the power to take them. So anyway, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So let me know what you think. And, and if it's worthwhile, it's a lot of work. It takes me about two days to produce an episode and I got to do it every week for 13 weeks, got 12 more weeks to go. And then hopefully, you know, things will calm down a little bit. It's a, it's, you know, when I got the mass casualty uh, commission, um, I've got radio interviews. I'll tell you about the one I just did. Um, we have national range day. We have all these, we have lawsuits going all over the place, as you well know. And so um, we've got a lot of projects happening. So it's, it's busy. I'm waiting for this show to end, which would be great. 
Um, but if it is worth doing, then we might do another 20 episode season sometime at the end of September. So let me know what you think about it. I think it's what I was trying to get out. Um, last thing I want to talk about is I, I did a, a radio interview. I haven't done very many of them recently, but I did one on CKNW on the Mike Smith show. And that's in Vancouver. I think it's the biggest talk radio station in Vancouver. And uh, it's it's typical media, which is, you know, here's a question you got, you know, answer it in, in, th in three sentences. So like, why does anyone need an AR-15? You got three sentences, you know, it's like, well, that's impossible. It's a complex social issue. Uh, but anyway, here's my best shot at it. So it's the same kind of format. Um, but Mike is, he's one of the good ones, Mike Smith, because he's, he looks at issues and he, like, I think he makes a, his own judgment. He's like, you know what, this, this doesn't seem to be the only take out there. And I don't think this, this may not be right. So I'm going to bring on an opposing view. So he really, he gave us that opportunity. He's been probably about five times so far in the last couple of years, five or six times, I think I've been on a show and, and I really appreciate that opportunity and I appreciate the honesty, right? Uh, because you, you need honesty in media or it loses its credibility. And then, of course, everything gets pretty weird because you don't know where to turn for actual credible information. I mean, this is this is the situation we find ourselves in on many issues, not just the gun issue. So anyway, all that saying, when you do something like the work that I do, for instance, right, you should be getting better at it over time, right? And <laughs> unless you're me, I guess, when it comes to doing stuff like this or broadcasting, right? I'm not meant to be a professional broadcaster or talk for a living, I don't think. But anyway, I can do it in sales, but I'm not I'm not that great on camera, I don't think. So um, aside from that, the other stuff that I do, I like to think that I'm getting better at it, right? And so before my interview on the radio was Najma Ahmed from the Doctors for Protection from Guns or whatever. And she's not getting any better at it. I think she's getting worse at it because she came on. And now the reason why you have a doctor on is because these are authority figures in our society. They're highly educated professionals. They do very serious, critical work, right? Like, you know, high, high impact work. You know, if you're going to open someone's chest and massage their heart into beating again, you know, you need somebody that's, that's fairly competent, right? And you, what you expect from doctors is a very professional, controlled, disciplined approach, patient approach to say, well, we've looked at the data. I'm going to give you an example and this and this. And, and you're expecting them to be the even keeled one. And then you're expecting the gun lobby representative to be somebody that sleeps with a loaded shotgun under his pillow and, you know, and, and, you know, spits when he's talking to people and swears at people and gets angry quick, right? This is the portrayal, right? Of, of gun owners that, that the government and these doctors and the media, they normally, right? That they try to show gun owners. Yeah, there's unruly people. We don't need them and we don't need their guns, right? And the roles are always seem to be like they're always reversed, right? So Najma comes on, uses the same old thing, this hysterical hair on fire, these killing rapid fire war killing machines meant for militaries to kill the most amount of people in the shores. They're machine guns, they're whatever, like all this stuff, it's same approach. And then she's even getting owned up a little bit by Mike Smith, who isn't even a gun owner to my knowledge. You know, he's not an expert on this, but he's heard both sides enough to go, I think I kind of know what's going on here. It's just very interesting. And then I come on and I'm like, well, okay, this wasn't, wasn't true. And here's why. Right. And so it's this weird role reversal. Anyway, the other interesting thing I wanted to pass on to you was Mike asked me like, would you take calls? You know, as if I'm going to say no, right. Cause you like taking calls is, is difficult because you could have anybody call in there. Right. And they could say anything to you and you got to react and whatever you say is going to live forever. Right. And it's going to be replayed and put into clips on the internet or on the news, which I've had happen, all that stuff, right? So you gotta, you have to be pretty, you have to understand your topic really well. Naj Mohammed would never take calls, right? Me, I'm begging to take calls and I'm not looking for people that agree with me because if everybody just goes, yeah, you're right, man. Yeah, just like Rod said or whatever, I'm not gonna ever get any better. I, I want to be challenged. I want the most articulate, you know, sharkish, you know, anti-gunner that has all the facts right at their fingertips and is really good in, you know, in inter interpersonal dialogue, right? That's, that's the challenge I'm looking for. That's why I always, you know, I offer the doctors $15,000 to sit down and just talk, right? Like, just like regular adults. No way. They just slandered us all over online instead of accepting that, right? Polly, even though, even though they say the worst things in the world about gun owners, people they don't even know, I'm always like, oh, I'll let, I'll let it go. Yeah, let's just talk together. There's no way. So um, I, I wish that they would filter out all the gun owners and just have the smartest, 
most, you know, highly competent anti-gun people to challenge me because it would just be better for me. Uh, I guess it's selfish in some way. But anyway, I never get them. I never get them. It's always gun owners or whatever. In the last conversation, uh, Paul was his name, and he was a police officer for 35 years and a sports shooter. And he comes on, he's like, Rod's right, blah, 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 blah. And so thank you, Paul, if you're a listener of the podcast, I appreciate that. But it's it's like, where are all these anti-gun people? This is my question. Like, where are they? If everyone in Canada, if 80% of Canadians want no guns whatsoever, where are they? Is it only conservatives or even liberals that own guns are the only people that's going to talk radio? It's the other way around, I think. But, so where are these people? Like, and it's not it's not just Vancouver. I've been on the radio in Ontario. I've been in the on the radio in Eastern Canada. I've been on the, on the radio in in Central Canada. I've been everywhere. I, and and every time I take calls, I never hear it from them. I think maybe once. I don't know. I can't remember exactly what it was. Maybe it was in Kitchener. Um, but I seem to remember maybe getting one person that was like, I'm really against it. And here's, but they never really made a real point. And I didn't really have to refute them. It was just like, I don't think so. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know what I can do with that. But I, anyway, the whole point is I just, it's very interesting. Where are all these Canadians that the anti-gunners say, oh, they agree. Where are all these Canadians that the, that the liberals say that, you know, and the anti-gun people like Pauly and the rest of them, and Suki, Sukier and, and everybody, they're all like, oh, the, the conservatives lost the election on, on gun control. It's like, really? Because I look at all these polls, like I look at all of them during election. And you know what? Gun control didn't make the top 14 election issues last time around. When Aaron O'Toole was, did the, did the flip-flop on it. it. Not even in the top 14. Interesting, right? And yet they're like, oh, this is this is it. This is the hot button. And, and the liberals are like, yeah, the Canadians elected us on this. Like, no, they didn't. They didn't even elect. There wasn't even in the top 14. How they, the, 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 um, the evacuation from Afghanistan made it into the top 14, but gun control didn't. I don't know. I just, just an interesting thing I thought I'd bring up. I just, I always wonder about this, you know, because I don't have all the information for, I don't have all the answers to everything. And I just, it's kind of interesting how they uh, how they do that. They say one thing and it's complete, and the the evidence is completely different. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me while I babbled on about that. It's just kind of anecdotes from working as a gun lobbyist, I guess. But um, anyway, enough of my uh, talking. I'm going to bring on Tracy Wilson right now. All right, via Skype, I've got Tracy Wilson from the CCFR. I think Wilson. <laughs> Giltaka. All right, so we've got a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to go fairly quickly. Uh, National Range Day, we've got, we, I promised to get the details to show what a big project yeah. it was and why it was so much work and took so much work to get here. Uh, why don't you give us, run us down the list of at least most things that we did to, to make this happen. <clears throat> okay, so the website is live now. You can go to nationalrangeday.ca. That is just a repository of information that holds all of these resources we're going to go through. So... Under the resource tab, you are going to find logos. You're going to find animated logos that you can use to make your own social media videos. You're going to find posters to put up at your club um, or, or graphics you can use on social media. You're going to find a set of three different promotional videos that are already made there that you can download and share onto your social media or in your email networks or, or however you want to get that out there. There's an entire list of communications that are, are going to be going out to almost everybody in the country. We've got a contact list of six or 700 uh, media and journalists that we're gonna send this out to just to sort of make them aware of what's going on. Uh, we've got comms that are going to be going out to clubs and ranges and wildlife federations, firearms organizations. We've got an army of social media influencers with big uh, followings on social media that are going to be engaged to help us do this. They're gonna promote it, make content, make videos. This is an all hands on deck situation. And there's just, there are a ton of, of moving pieces that are involved in this. So make sure you get on there and check it out. At the same time, once you decide what you're gonna do for National Range Day, you can register that event on the website. That information comes in, we plug it into the interactive map and you can use that map to find your event, to find an event near you, to find something you can volunteer at. You can drill it down like, I need something within 10 kilometers. Or you can, you know, pull it way back out. I'll travel up to 200 kilometers to go to a cool event. It's it's a really cool interactive map tool, so you'll be able to use that as well. So there's, there's a lot going on. 
there's support if you have questions or need support or are looking for something you can't find or just not really sure what to do or need some more guidance, you can reach out at info at nationalrangeday.ca and someone will get back to you to answer your questions. There's going to be resources. What do I do if I'm an individual? What do I do if I'm a club? How can I help? What kind, What does this event look like? So there's just a, a wealth of information and resources available. There's no reason why we can't get millions of people out to the range on Jan- June 4th, 2020. Yeah, and and as we as we develop more resources between now and June fourth, those will show up on the website. And one more thing I'd like to add is that um, all of the the logos for National Range Day are trademarked. Yeah. And what you do is you go to the website if you're you know the BC Wildlife Federation or you're one of the other firearm organizations and you want to make T-shirts or whatever, just email us. Um, mm-hmm. What you know, what you want to do, and and what we'll do is we'll email you a license, and it's 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 your license to make T-shirts or use the logo in in any appropriate way that you want to with, and it doesn't cost anything. So yeah, it doesn't is, cost anything. It is free for everybody. It's it's um it's protected. That's why it's trademarked. We don't want someone to come and trademark it 10 years from now and go, well, there was no trademark. It's mine now. <laughs> now I'm going to go after everybody that's ever used it or anything like that. It's it's a situation where now you can have a license. You can make, I mean, if you're an individual and you want to make t-shirts and sell them on a street corner with the logo on them, email us. We'll email you a license. You're fully legal to do that. And you you keep all the money or you donate it or whatever. It's it's basically for it's protected so that it can't go awry, but it's it's free for everyone to use. And, and that's and that, and you know, that's the big part of, it doesn't belong to the CCFR. That's the most important part for all of this. So anyway, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. Moving on. We got uh, more stuff to uh, talk about. We've got, we've got uh, SECU, the, uh, the study <laughs> on gun, ga- gun and gang violence. What's going on with that? Well, I think that study, uh, so this is the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, short form SECU. And this is the study. It's called Gun Control, Illegal Arms Trafficking, and the Increase in Gun Crimes Committed by Members of Street Gangs. <clears throat> so this was a study, of course, initiated by the Bloc Québécois, looking at the increase in street violence. And to be honest, it's been going on for weeks. We've heard from dozens of expert witnesses. There's been hours and hours of testimony. People have asked, how come we haven't testified? And it's like, well, this it's not really our our deal because the people out there committing the violence aren't aren't our community right so it's been going really well and of course today it's sort of wrapping up they had a three-hour session with minister of public safety marco mendicino and of course the entire conversation after weeks of talking about all these amazing solutions and concrete credible tangible things we can do to uh, reduce violence and increase public safety of course, today it was pretty much a conversation about gun bans. So, yeah, super frustrating. But um, overall, I think if I look back at the testimony and everything that we heard throughout these the study, which, of course, will be the foundation for a report that goes to the House of Commons um, and, of course, will be the foundation for whatever legislation they dream up next, if they took it for what it was, you know, the granular actual facts and discussions that were had by the expert witnesses. Um, I think it was a wonderful debate and conversation and it's been really great to follow it along. Um, But I never ever just assume that the liberals are gonna do anything evidence-based. So, you know, we'll have to see what happens, but yeah, I think that's wrapping up. So expect a report coming out. They, if the committee members themselves from the various parties can't decide on a, a sort of a wrap-up report, then you end up with oppositional reports, which means they have conflicting information. And, you know, uh, either way, I think the Liberals will just do what Liberals do. But, um, of course, it would if it would be going against the evidence if they continue their attack on legal gun owners. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I don't, look, don't look for that to subside anytime soon because with them yeah. it's ideological. You know, they've had... They've had three top police officers tell them flat out, we don't need a gun ban. This has nothing to do with uh, licensed gun owners, uh, all that stuff. But it's like, nope. Uh, So here's what we're going to do. Despite everything everybody said in the entire study, (laughs) gun ban, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's just like a, I, I, it's in front of yeah, your face, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's it's overt. It's right there. It's like we don't care about any of this stuff. We don't care about the real reason there's shootings. We don't care about the shootings. Gun ban, you know? I know. Yeah. It's uh it's frustrating, but of course gun control is always a perfect channel changer for a government that's sort of, you know, floundering around and that's yeah. been this way for six years. So it has. Yeah. All right. Next on the list. Um, <laughs> I can't use that title, um, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> we have our own title for things. And uh, I'm not saying this one. But anyway, uh, Marco Mendicino, we had we had high hopes for him. Um, you know, we looked at his background and, you know, he's always seemed like a reasonable person. And, and what we wanted, I think, more than anything, certainly in our business at the CCFR was that we wouldn't see somebody like Bill Blair again, someone that would say the most outrageous, hysterical, uh, completely unhinged things um, in front of the Canadian people as a as a government minister. Because I mean, that, that undermines trust in the entire system. You wonder why there's problems with trust in institutions. I mean, Bill Blair is a, is a case study in how yeah. not to behave as a government official. So we had high hopes for Marco Minicino, and then now it starts. it's starting to look like it's heading down that road. So we had some interesting things to say about the trucker protest and uh, and the reason, I, and I know I'm going on and on, but the reason why I'm going on in my way to explain why we're talking about this is that we see this all the time. And it also reflects on who we have to deal with as a, as a government, uh, you know, um, counterpart. So anyway. Right, so in SECU, which is of course the uh, Public Safety Committee, they, aside from the gun study, they're also doing a study on the Emergencies Act. They're doing studies on, you know, how the uh, convoy came to Ottawa. And, you know, there's a variety of different things that they're studying aside from gun control. And he made a particular statement in committee. I've got it here. There were Ottawans who were subjected to intimidation, harassment, threats of rape. So he made that statement, which is like, wow, whoa, that's, I mean, you know. That's pretty serious. And of course, uh, Raquel Doncho, who is the opposition critic for public safety on the conservative side, she sort of questioned this like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, of course, there's been no sexual assault charges laid in the city of Ottawa um, throughout the entire time the convoy was here or after. In fact, OPS shows that, you know, general crime stats in the city were down during the uh, three weeks that they were here. And she was a little frustrated, you know, as a female going into the House of Commons. Like if you're saying there there's a threat of rape out in the protest, how are you allowing female members of parliament or journalists or just other uh, female women, uh, female Canadians to walk through this or buy it if it's if that's true? And, that, you know, when you think about it, they debated the use of the Emergencies Act for 40 hours in the House of Commons. Like I watched that relentlessly and there was a lot of different things that they brought up about the convoy and the protest and and both sides of 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 the story here not once in 40 hours of debate did anybody mention any threats of rape and yet he throws it out in public safety committee he's been asked to clarify like to sh show some evidence like what do you mean was there an instance i mean if i was out in public and somebody threatened to rape me, I'm going to call 911. Like, there should be some sort of evidence somewhere, right? That's pretty a pretty serious allegation. In any event, of course, you know, that's been swept under the carpet. You won't hear anything really from the legacy media. Uh, the Sun picked it up and a, a bunch of the independent media. But then on the flip side of that, you sort of got this story about Brienne, a single mom from Chilliwack, who apparently donated $50 to the convoy as it was rolling across the country before it was deemed illegal. And she's saying her accounts, her bank accounts have been frozen. A conservative MP tweeted out about this, you know, using the name Brienne, um, which I wouldn't be surprised if that was sort of a, a cover name, because if you look at the doxing of donators, from that list of, of donators that was leaked. I mean, I I wouldn't want it, I wouldn't want anybody's real name to be put out there, right? In any event, this was picked up by everybody. You go on Google and just search Brianne single mom Chilliwack, and there's literally 
pages and reams and reams and reams of stories about it, you know, calling it out and accusing this conservative MP of making up a story and whatever, but not a word, zero coverage of Marco Mendocino saying in public safety committee that there were threats of rape um, in the streets of Ottawa. And I'm, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very telling state that we are in here in, in Canada. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no, I, I haven't seen any stories like it's, this didn't turn into a story. It's only turned into a story of of people being outraged that he said it, but there's no CBC isn't searching all over the place or, or asking him where that allegation came from and then tracing it back to find out if that really happened or whatever. It's like, Oh, this is a nothing burger. But somebody oh, that yeah. donated fifty bucks—I mean, they're they're Mark Strahl is is my MP here in Chilliwack, and you know they're 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 completely you know all over him, like being attacked by a monkey. They are all over him. He can't get them oh, yeah. off. Trying to find well, where who is this woman really? Is this like oh, they're going to sniff out this big conspiracy, and then Mendocino says something like this after forty hours of not saying a word, and it's like oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, there there's oh, probably yeah. a bunch of rape allegations for sure. Like it's just the double standard and, and of course, I don't want to get too far down this, this road because, you know, like, I mean, we live this stuff all the time, but it's like, and the media are so shocked, right? They're just like, you know, and people are are interfering with their, their, their broadcast, they're yelling at them. They, you know, they don't trust them and they're like, and, and all the media, it's, it's fine. I don't know what happens to them psychologically where they're like, where's this coming from? I, I, you know, <laughs> nobody shocked. told me like, what, oh, you guys are mad at us. Why? What, what could you ever have, you know? And they're just like, they're just shocked. Right. They're just like, oh, where's my pearls. And, and, and it's like, this is the kind of stuff, as long as it's, as long as it's a conservative and, and someone that's running counter to the, what the government wants. Oh, they'll, they'll spend half a million dollars chasing down the story and digging in. I'm surprised that the W5 and the fifth estate aren't capped out on, on Mark Strahl's lawn. Trying to oh, yeah. blow this case Searching wide open. Ch- the streets of Chilliwack. Yeah, for going through his garbage, that. maybe looking for a memo that was tossed out, right? Yeah. But, you, but yet, Bill Blair could say the most outrageous, like heinous things, and now Mendicino's starting to do that. Like it's I, disappointing. I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know why people tolerate this stuff. Just it is. It is shocking. But anyway. Yeah. All right. Um. But I, you know, we face this kind of stuff all the time. This. You know, it's not even biased reporting. It is like full on collusion because they won't report on anything. They won't even look into certain things. And then they're just all over you about other things. It's just, and it's, and it's not just one. I know I'm going on and on about it, but it's not just the CBC doing it. It's all of them doing all it. All of them. Like who, yeah. who's writing these memos or whatever, right? Like, I don't like going down those roads too much, but like, you know, like it's in your face. So. Anyway. Well, I'll tell you who's doing it. If you go over to Blacklocks, they've actually got a story about Marco Mendicino contacting journalists and telling them to be careful um, how they report on the convoy. So there's, you know, this is the, this is information uh, acquired through A tips, right? So where where are all the normal people <laughs> in in politics? Like where are where are all the normal people? The people that kind of roll up there and be like, oh, okay, here's what I found out, folks. You know, here's the information. Yeah, I don't think that's right, too. You know, I'll, I'm going to follow up on that. Like, just normal people that talk normally and that have a little bit of restraint, a little bit of discipline. Like, I just, where are these people? Anyway. They're, yeah. it's, they're not in politics because they're, it's like the system is rigged. I mean, you know, sometimes if you look at the quality of, of people who run in politics, you know, there's some there's some good, solid people, of course. But um, a lot of times, you know, not many people can afford to take a year off work and fund a campaign to run for politics. So um, it's sort of a, it's a job of the privileged, right? So, yeah. Yeah, or the or the desperate, right, sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, out of those, I don't know how many MPs there are now, but previously- 338. No, there was previously the election cycle, but there's a couple new ones now, right? So I think it's 342 or something like that. Now, it changed, right? Oh. They, they changed some writings. And, and, uh, I don't know. I haven't met all the MPs, but just kind of, if I were to guess, there's about 40 good people there. But anyway, yeah. all right, let's move on. Um, Toronto Sportsman Show, apparently it's yeah. moving forward. <laughs> I am I feel like this is exciting. This is good news. So that that's kind of some dark stuff. 
Toronto Sportsman Show is back on after two years of being canceled due to the pandemic. It's super exciting. So this is March 17th through the 20th at the International Centre in Toronto. The CCFR will be there. I will be there in the booth through the entire thing. We are booth number 1040. I've also got a speaking spot. I'm, I was hoping to find out the time before we recorded today, but on Saturday afternoon, I will be speaking on the main stage. Of course, I'm going to be doing a spiel about National Range Day and then taking questions from the audience. So that'll be great. You come by our booth. We've got raffles going on. You can win cool things. Um, we're going to be selling swag, hats and T-shirts. You can grab your membership there. You can come and renew your membership. Come by and say hi. I've got a whole bunch of lanyards and stickers will be given away for free. And good news is, as of today, there's no Vaxport required in Ontario. So I know previously the show had said you would need a Vaxport to get in. That is scrapped. No Vaxport needed. I believe we are still under a mask mandate. But, you know, that's where we are. But, yeah, come on out. The show um, is great. It's a huge show. It's Ontario's largest show and all kinds of good stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Super fun. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to make it there um, because I have so much work to do. <laughs> I know. So much that uh, that I could never afford to take those days. And I'm even, you know, some things that I should be more involved in are falling by the wayside. But that's that's great news. And uh, hopefully a lot of people decide to just to break out of out of quarantine and just come on out. You know, it's been yeah, so long. Yeah, come on out yeah. and see me. I'm going to be there through the, the whole thing. And yeah, I love seeing everybody. And it's, I feel like we're emerging from some dark cave after two years, right? So it'll be uh, fun to actually see faces. So. All yeah. right. All right. Now, the last thing we have to deal with is the final neon sign draw. Yes. Exciting. <sighs> All right. Let me see if I can make this work. So I'm going to go here one second. Um... Oh, yeah. Just stand by. And then there we go. All right. So we've got, as usual, we're going to use random.org. We're going to count the the uh, the number of rows, put them in there, and find out who won. So we got row number one through okay. 822. Oh, wow. One through 822. So one, eight. Two, we need like a drum roll. Okay. Eight two two, one to eight twenty two. Good. Generate. One sixty. One sixty seven. Oh, an early entry. Nice. All right. Sixty seven. All right. It's Dennis from Whit Whitby, Ontario. Dennis, All right. Yeah, nice, awesome. Dennis. All right. And I'm just going to get rid of this stuff. I have to do things different because I've been. Uh, there we go. All right. <laughs> All right. I, oh, yeah. Usually I say Dennis's last name, but you know what? I can't pull that up again. It's too much work. But uh, Dennis from Whitby, uh, you will hear from us and uh, and you'll get your neon sign. It was what? It was fire rights or human rights, I think. I uh, Yeah. I believe so. Or right. these guns are not for sale. I don't know. I, I got to confirm I mean, with staff or Steve. It might have been. But it was that. one of those giant ones with a gun on it. So. Well, the the right sign was on the website when you donated and and right. entered into that. So that's, that's uh, correct. Whatever whatever that sign is, you're gonna you're gonna get it fairly quickly. So congratulations, Dennis. Really appreciate all the support and thanks to everybody who 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 donated over this time. Um, obviously for us to do all these projects, we <laughs> we need the donations and I can't yeah. tell you how much we appreciate it. So thank you for that. Good stuff. All right. I think we are at the end of our list. We did it. All right. We did it. Another uh, another one down. Yeah. 20, 21 and a half minutes. So um, it wasn't too bad. Not too bad. All right, Wilson. We will talk to you next time. All right. We'll see you soon. All right, that's going to do it for episode 111 of the CCFR Radio podcast. Congratulations to Dennis Golka from Whitby, Ontario, for being the final winner of the Light Up 2021 Neon Sign Contest. Uh, make sure that you guys uh, send us pictures of the neon sign in action in your man cave or whatever. Uh, maybe it's on the on a, the front face of your kitchen cabinets. I'm sure your wife won't mind. It's all for the cause, correct? Um, but, uh, last thing I'm going to say is if you aren't a member of the CCFR or you're not supporting the CCFR currently, 
can consider doing that. If you want to become a member, you can do that at firearmrights.ca. If you want to make a donation, you can do that there. If you want to donate directly to our legal case, we can always use all the help we can get for that. There's a legal link there so that you know that your donation goes specifically into the legal trust account, which we only pay the lawyer's bills from. Um, or you can give us a monthly gift if you can afford it. So you can do that on a recurring basis. So th these are all ways you can help the CCFR. And if you're not in a position in these hard times to do that, that's okay too. Uh, join our social media feeds and and share the our, our media posts, share our videos, share the podcast, you know, try to get gun owners into uh, being more interested in their ability to own and use firearms. All that stuff is important stuff that doesn't cost you anything, right? Even if you're a member of another firearm organization, just do that work, right? That's just, that's just as important as everything else. So anyway, I, I appreciate all the support that all of you have given us. Take care and we'll see you soon. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.